This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Check out our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, at youtube.com slash UCTV Prime. Subscribe today to get new programs every week. My name is Peter Hartman, and I'm the chair of the uh, MIT Enterprise Forum for the Central Coast. And um, uh, I have put together this program with a great staff and also uh, with the TMP program, and we get into that a little bit later. But I just want to mention a few things about the MIT Enterprise Forum. Um, it's kind of one of the best secrets, kept secrets, I think. Uh, we've actually been here. Uh, since 1986, and MIT Enterprise Forum uh, is coming out of the MIT um, alumni organization in MIT in Cambridge, and uh, we have 28 chapters in the world, and we happen to have one chapter here in Santa Barbara, and we've been here for, like I said, uh, 25 years. Um, we do um, our. our, our our mission is very simple. Uh, what we try to do is basically um, connect entrepreneurs uh, in the community, and we do that by having these events. And we do nine events every year. And those events are world-class events, and we typically have them actually down at the Cabrillo Beach Arts Center. But uh, this event, we have uh, worked together with the TMP, and we're having it here at the UCSB campus. Um, also, this event is being uh, filmed, and we are um, basically having this content available. It was going to be shown on the Santa Barbara community uh, channel. I think it's channel 21, if I recall, but I don't know the, the, uh, the uh, schedule and so on. Um, I want to mention a couple of things here about uh, technology, because there's really a buzz going on in this community right now about technology. And uh, um, there are many very successful technology companies here in this town, and most people probably don't even know this in uh, general terms, that this is really a hotbed for technology. And um, um, we have here, I think, in this community, a great mix of um, education from the UCSB, of course. We have some great, smart people here in town, entrepreneurs, seasoned, seasoned entrepreneurs. And we also have capital, and we also have a great support team of attorneys and financial folks and so on. So we have all the ingredients to become very um, successful in this area. One of the things that... Um, um, we have taken charge of as an organization is to try to bring together a lot of the organizations in the community. Um, fortunately, Santa Barbara have a lot of buzz, but it's also a lot of organizations and it's very fragmented uh, what they do and so on. And one of the things that we're trying to do is to, in conjunction with the UCSB, um, try to connect those dots and really try to move this forward. I think we have a great opportunity to do this. So there's a lot of things happening in the community and I think you will see that in the next couple of months or whatever uh, with startups, uh, incubators, support, etc. cetera, in, um, in here in, in, in Santa Barbara.
Peter suggested I say a few words about TMP, and um, I thought it was appropriate because it, it, when you understand what TMP is, you understand the connection with the MIT Enterprise Forum. So TMP is uh, one of the uh, one of the biggest entrepreneurship programs in town, actually, that nobody knows about. Um, it's uh, it started on campus about 12 years ago in the College of Engineering as a fairly small. Uh, entrepreneurship program for students in engineering, and it's grown uh, in last year to 670 students, 570 at the undergraduate level and 100 plus at the graduate level. So it's really grown a lot over the years, and it's quite a popular program on campus. And uh, and we're intending to grow it further from here. And a big part of that is working with community groups that are uh, similarly uh, affiliated with and inspired by entrepreneurship uh, as we. We are. And in fact, with the uh, MIT Enterprise Forum, many of the members and some of you in the audience have been serving as mentors in the TMP program, helping our young entrepreneurs on campus. Uh, so the fit is really natural between the two organizations. And if anything, it's, uh, it's more surprising that we haven't done this before um, that, than we're doing it now. So, uh, so we're re really pleased to host the meeting. I hope this is the first of many to come. I have been asked to tell you everything I know about venture capital in 10 minutes. <clears throat> so I'm going to make it fast. But before I do that, a couple quick announcements. First, I was asked to bring 100 copies of the presentation. So if you're on the flanks here and you didn't receive a hard copy and you'd like one, we'll either post it on the Enterprise Forum's website, if that's possible, or send me an email and I'll send you a PDF of it. And then secondly, uh, I usually uh, present this in a kind of a full-blown version called Shaking the Money Tree with a panel of VCs of my own. The next one is December 1st in Santa Monica, and the details are on the back of that presentation. So you're welcome to join us there if you just can't get enough of all the good data. So here we go. I thought what I would do is give you a broad context of what's happened in the venture capital community. This is a survey that tracks all domestic investments made by institutional VCs and organized angel groups in the US. We partner with the National Venture Capital Association and Thomson Reuters to compile the data and then we publish it each quarter. Now our topic tonight is about have the rules changed for venture capital funding? And I was talking earlier with some folks and I guess I kind of analogize it to a football game. There's different rules for different situations. So I, I do think that the defense is using a different scheme right now, that to the VCs, but it's one that they've dusted off. It's, it's the environment has changed, so they're reactive. And what I think I'll show you is what the landscape looks like now, and then the panel will tell you the rules that apply to the current landscape, if that makes sense. So if we look at venture capital funding back, this is national data. So we're going to start with the national data, then look at Southern California. Then I put together a couple slides that look at the tri-county region, uh, San Luis Obispo, Santa Barbara, and Ventura. But if we look nationally, back to 1981, you can see back when venture capital was somewhat of a cottage industry, uh, just a couple billion dollars invested each quarter. 1995, the Netscape IPO, that's catapulted venture capital into uh, the household um, vernacular. Uh, the term VC became known by pretty much everybody. The rise, you can tell from the chart here where the internet bubble peaked, I hope. And then the drop off, and then with 2008, the financial services meltdown, we had another drop off, and then a slow march back up. And uh, most recently, this is third quarter data, so year to date in the US, there were 21, just over $21 billion invested in about 2,725 companies. So it always amazes me because this money is distributed, this investment's distributed all over the country. There's VC investments occasionally in Hawaii and Alaska even. Um, but we're fortunate, we're in the state that received the most. California received about 3.3 billion, and this now is Q1, or excuse me, Q3 data. So about 47%, typically about half of the money comes into California. Most of that, as you would imagine, is Silicon Valley, 2.7 billion. They usually get 35 to 40%. And then we, down in Southern California, receive about 10% of the national funding. So the same data, but sliced by region, basically just ranks what we just saw on the map. You can see the huge lead that Silicon Valley has over the rest of the, the regions. <clears throat> New York in Q3 jumped up to the second spot that's typically um, uh, taken by New England. Uh, and we remained in the number three spot 
with about $603 million invested into 72 companies. So now we slice it by industry, and what we've seen over the past few quarters, or probably the last few years, maybe two to three years, with the emergence of clean tech as a discrete venture category, VCs now talk of the three legs of the venture stool, and it's, it's basically life sciences, which comprises biotech and med devices, clean tech, which is represented here by the industrial energy category. That's an old classification, but we fit most of the clean tech uh, investment into that, and then um, software. So software had a big uptick with um, over $2 billion funded, and then um, biotech and the clean tech category. If we look at stage of development, what, um, what stage are these companies at when they receive the funding? This is our first indication that something might not be right for entrepreneurs. Uh, we really would expect to see more early stage companies than later stage companies receive funding, and that's because the venture pipeline is just that. Uh, money comes in from limited partners, it's put to work by the general partners in the form of investments to entrepreneurs, and then hopefully it'll come out of the back of the pipeline either as an IPO or a successful trade sale. There hasn't been a lot of robust activity on the back end of that pipeline. Uh, the IPO market, we saw a little bit of sizzle a few quarters ago. It's, it's now died down. So um, there's a lot of backlog. So we're continuing to fund the later and expansion stage companies represented by the top two bars, and that's at the expense of the earlier stage companies. Likewise, if we look at the sequence of funding or the round of funding, the E rounds and beyond uh, top the chart. That's not a good thing. If you're an investor, I'm sure you guys don't like E, F, and G rounds. You'd rather see some activity on the liquidity front before you get to that point. The good news, though, is that there were 269 first round deals funded. Uh, so in terms of number of deals, uh, that led the way. It's just the dollar amount going into it uh, wasn't uh, where we'd like to see it. Okay, so that's what happened nationally. If we look closer to home, Southern California, I mentioned the over 600 million invested. Uh, that was down slightly. This chart represents, on a quarterly basis, our funding back to 2002. And if you look at it on an annual basis, it looks very much like the national trend. We pretty much are a microcosm of what happens nationally. In fact, if you slice Southern California by industry, it's these same industries in a little bit different order, but software led the way, led by, or, or followed by clean tech, biotech, and then med devices. And I'm not gonna drill down to the actual dollar amount level just because we've got a, a time element here, but um, that's all in the report, and if you have any follow-up questions, feel free to ping me, and I'm happy to provide some backup data. Okay, our three subregions in Southern California, Los Angeles, um, received about 260 million. Uh, we're really evolving into, uh, in, 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 unfortunately for us, and some of you might uh, hiss at this, but Santa Barbara is included in the greater Los Angeles region. Um, so in that broad region, uh, digital media and clean tech have emerged as our two, what I would call flagship industries, and they tend to get the bulk of the funding. <clears throat> so you can see industrial energy received 61 million into three deals, and then the consumer retailing and software sectors all have a component of digital media in it. We don't track internet specific deals, but what we do do is put them in the industry classification that represents the underlying industry. So if it's a financial services, digital media or internet company would fall under that category. If it's consumer products, uh, you get the idea. Um, Orange County is typically a med device uh, center, and this quarter was no different with um, the, the leading industry of med devices. And then if we go further south, San Diego is typically a biotech hub, but this quarter was a little bit different with software uh, bringing in 98 million in six companies. So that brings us down, and I think I'm good on time, Bill, You're so doing far. Well, Randy. Um, I just put these together just for this presentation, um, and this is the Tri County funding again, San Luis Obispo, Santa Barbara, and Ventura County, and it's quarterly funding um, back to 2002. And you can see, because it's a small sample size, it, it doesn't show you a lot of trends, but what it does show you is a lot of spikes, fits, and starts. And from talking with VCs, they always tell me, don't get too excited about differences between in funding levels between quarters. There could be term sheets on desk and things. You really need to look at the overall trend. So I think the important thing here is, as was mentioned earlier, is, is Santa Barbara is really a, 
a hub of technology with the university and with some of the uh, other companies that have emerged uh, out of the area. And in Q3 alone, we had just 6.6 .6 million funded into five deals. But if you look at what the next chart here represents, this is year to date, and this is year to date as of yesterday. Um, so really, what, 10 and a half months? Uh, $95 million was funded just in the Tri-County region into 16 deals. Um, most of that is what I would call the hard technology deals, and I think in large part because of the strong engineering program here, um, about two-thirds of the dollars and uh, about seven of the deals, almost half of the deals were in um, you know, the basic science and not the software digital media or clean tech deals. So I'm gonna, that's it for the investment side. I'm going to wrap it up with a couple of slides that are probably of more interest to entrepreneurs. This is a list of venture firms and investors, organized angel groups that participate in the survey based in our region. So DFJ Frontier, they do have an office here in Santa Barbara, led in the quarter with seven deals funded. The Tech Coast Angels were active with five. Avalon Ventures is a biotech uh, investor down south with five deals. And then Miramar, Seamer, and Qualcomm all with four deals. But again, these are deals made regardless of where the company's based, just the investor is here. More telling is looking at the list of investors in our region. And this is the second point for concern because you'll note, you know, DFJ Frontier, four out of seven deals were funded locally. Tech Coast Angels, four out of five. But then you get into a list of investors outside of our region, and there's there's a dearth of venture investors here. We're losing investors. Uh, a lot of the funds that were funded at the rise or the height of the internet bubble have now come and gone. They can't raise a, a second fund. So the percentage of money funding our companies is increasing quarter by quarter. Most of it's coming from Silicon Valley, uh, quite a bit of it from the East Coast, and some of it from overseas. Last couple slides, and I'm done very quickly. I just want to make a couple points on IPO activity. I mentioned how it's not super robust. Uh, year to date, there were 41, uh, this is third quarter, 41 venture backed IPOs. Uh, last year, we had about 75 all year. Uh, but Q3, only five. Likewise, on the M&A front, there were 310 deals funded. Average deal size is about 100, and just under 150 million. So those aren't what I would call robust. So that's the third kind of negative data point. Uh, so we don't have LP investment. We don't have a lot of indigenous funding. And there aren't a lot of liquidity opportunities. And last but not least, the fourth kind of negative point, and that's what I'm going to leave the panel with. <laughs> Don't mean to be all negative. But if you look at the LP fundraising since 2007, this is money that the general partnerships raised in turn to then invest in companies, has steadily declined from over $30 billion in 02, or I'm sorry, in 07, down to just $12 billion last year. And if you look at the most recent quarter, a paltry $1.7 billion was raised. So at some point, it's going to catch up because the money coming in doesn't equal the money going out. And unless something changes on the endowment side and the LP side, um, you guys are going to be talking to other people other than VCs to try to fund your company. But that's, that's probably the bright point is there are alternatives. So with that, I will turn it back to Bill. Thank you very much. Santa Barbara has a, and UCSB in particular, has a very special place in my heart. Um, <clears throat> literally um, half of my life began here. Um, so about, I think about 23 years ago that I <clears throat> came to the campus, um, literally stepping out of a plane and uh, got an opportunity to enroll in the computer science program here. Um, did my master's uh, and in my final quarter, uh, I was walking down the campus from Engineering One <clears throat> and saw a sign for free pizza and beer. Um, walked in, uh, took the bait, and there were two guys in suits um, next to a big computer that looked like a refrigerator. And um, they said, well, why don't you go and open the door? And I opened the door, and there, there was a you know, the computer was running. And they said, like, well, take out the power supply. And I took the power supply out. <clears throat> and it was still running. And then they said, well, take out the disk out. And I took the disk out. It still kept running. I said, well, take out the memory. And I took the memory out. It still kept running. I said, what is this thing? Um, and the movie Terminator hadn't come out at that point, so I didn't have the analogy to use. But <clears throat> they're like, well, this is a tandem computer. Like, well, what does that do? I said, well, it's a fault tolerant machine. It cannot be killed. You know, it keeps running no matter what happens. <laughs> um, 
And long story short, I got a job out of a campus interview at Tandem Computers, and it brought me to Silicon Valley, and I never left. So um, it's been 20 years since I've been in the Valley. Uh, started my career as an engineer, um, thanks to the training I got here on this campus, and then um, did a variety of things, um, both on the hardware and the software side. Um, I learned my internet um, chops, if you could say that, at Google. Uh, I was there for seven years and just got a tremendous education and mentorship from the founders and, and Eric and, and others. Uh, and then I um, have been dabbling into venture capital and decided this year, earlier this year, to join full time. Um, I've done a couple of other ventures since prior. <clears throat> But again, thanks for having me. It's also great to see that MIT and UCSB are collaborating together, uh, two great institutions coming together to promote entrepreneurship. Uh, I think when unemployment rate is at about 9%, 10%, um, supporting entrepreneurship, entrepreneurs are the ones who create jobs for the rest of the economy, and I think seeing that come to fruition here is a great thing to see, so thanks again. <clears throat> now, Bill asked me to cover um, venture capital from the perspective of a, um, early stage venture capital firm, which is what we are, NOS partners, and I'll talk a little bit about the firm, um, what we do, whether things have changed for us, and if they have, why have they changed, and what do we look for uh, in terms of the companies that we look to invest in. But before I do any of that, um, I wanna do a quick poll of the audience, um, just to help me out here and making sure that I, whatever I say is relevant to you guys, uh, and I'm not wasting the next half an hour of your time. So. Show of hands quickly, if a couple of questions. How many of you are currently students on the campus? Okay, so about 10% of the population, small. How many of you are running companies right now or looking to start companies? That's a pretty large population, that's good. You're in the right forum. Um, <laughs> how many of you think you would be looking to go out and raise money in the next, let's say, six to nine months? Okay, that's pretty good. Um, how many of you have an iPhone? How many have an Android phone? That's good. Very nice. Um, <laughs> I used to have an Android phone. Now I have an iPhone and an Android phone. Um, all right, that's cool. How many of you have, I was talking to Kevin O'Connor who founded DoubleClick and who lives here in Santa Barbara uh, earlier today, and he said, if you, if you do a poll, ask them two questions. So I'm gonna ask them to do, do that. And so, how many of you um, are using Facebook regularly? Let's say, you know, two or three times a day, okay? How many of you are using Twitter? Okay, more people use Twitter than Facebook. How many of you are using Facebook or Twitter more this year than you were last year? More this year. How many less this year compared to last year? Okay, more people, using, more, more people are using it less than, than last year. Interesting, okay, well thank you for entertaining me. Appreciate that. Um, I, will, I will tailor my presentation to the entrepreneurs in the room who are looking to raise money in the next nine to 12 months and hopefully it's relevant to you. And we'll take some questions at the end, so I'll, I'll move quickly. All right, so talk about three things. Who are we as a firm? Um, has there been a climate change? And I'm talking about the venture capital climate. Um, and what do we look for? So quickly, our firm, InterWest Partners, uh, was started 32 years ago. We are a diversified firm that does investments both in life sciences and IT. We do not do clean tech, which is the third leg of the stool that uh, Randy talked about. Uh, we have been fortunate to associate with entrepreneurs who have taken um, 72 companies public um, and about you know, 50 plus profitable exits. Um, so essentially, we are in the business of building companies that survive and are sustainable businesses. And we typically like to get in at the early stage um, of the company's life cycle. So we're typically the first person, the first investor that the entrepreneur partners with as they are looking for their financing options. Um, so you could call it, you know, you could call it seed stage or series A or early stage in general. It's not, and it's not about the uh, particular size of the check that we write. We write everything from, Hundred thousand dollars to you know five to seven million dollars. So it's not the size of the check; it's the timing of the check. And typically, we are the first ones to to partner with the entrepreneur. Um, some past companies you may have heard of, mostly in the technology space. I will not speak to life sciences a whole lot because I, my background is IT, so that's where I'm more familiar with. But Silicon Graphics, um, obviously a computer server company, um, Sienna, an optical networking technology pioneer in that. 
um, Stratacom, Xilinx, Semiconductor Chip Companies, a company called Hippocrates, which went public earlier this year, uh, which was the first uh, large-scale application of um, mobile apps for physicians. Um, and it's an interesting, interesting company that brings together healthcare, mobile technology, and internet um, into under one fold and, and doing something interesting that, again, uh, after 10, 10 years of execution, was able to go public earlier this year. Some of the current companies that are in the portfolio right now, they're not, these are not liquid companies that are uh, being built. Uh, in the mobile space, um, companies like Tabjoy and Flurry, they do everything from analytics to monetization. Exalt, which is in the mobile backhaul space, so as bandwidths, uh, bandwidth is always an issue. There's always a bottleneck somewhere, so chasing the bottleneck is part of our thesis, and we are always chasing the bottleneck, wherever it happens to be, whether it's in the local area network, wide area network, uh, or somewhere else. Um, software as a service in the enterprise space, Marketo, Get Satisfaction, Spreadfast, you may have heard about some of these companies. Um, and then also in the advertising and e-commerce space, companies, Brand.net, which is a display advertising platform, um, Lockbox, which is a, you could call it double click for deals um, in the local commerce space. Uh, and then we talked about Hippocrates. Doximity is the, is the next company of the, the founder of Hippocrates, and, and Doximity is effectively, you could call it LinkedIn for physicians. It's a social network that connects physicians uh, at the point of care, so that if you are an individual and you have a couple of, couple of doctors who are working with you to, to, um, to um, help you with your condition, they can talk to each other confidentially in a trusted fashion about your condition. Anyway, those are some of the companies. It gives you a glimpse of the kind of areas that we are interested in. Now, one of the things I always tell my audience is you have to know the biases of the speaker so that you can discount everything he or she says uh, accordingly. So these are my biases. These are the things that I know, everything from mainframe, which is tandem, the big refrigerator box, started moving um, down, the, down the scale to uh, fax modems, which is a, um, in, in the mid-90s, I got involved with a company called Global Village Communication. If you had a Mac, and back in that, those days, you had probably a modem. Um, for those of you who are younger than me, modems did exist. Um, that's how you used to get connected on the internet. Um, and then um, I started my internet career with a company called HX, where I was the co-founder. I started the company doing online payments. We raised money from institutional venture capitalists, um, built a product revenue, and then eventually sold the company to First Data, which is a big financial services firm. So I've been on the other side of the equation uh, as an entrepreneur. And then obviously we talked about Google um, and a company called Dig, which is a social news site. Um, and then I have a product in my own house right now, which is a two and a half year old product, um, and that, that is something that I'm still learning every day, how to, how to, um, how to be successful using that product. Uh, not, not doing a great job, but what I'm learning through that is how mobile technology is pervading um, people's lives at a very early stage in your, in, your, in your existence, and then how it's going to transform, hopefully, his life over, um, over many more decades to come. So it's been fascinating to watch um, how two-year-old kids use things like iPad. Um, so that's a, we will talk more about that in terms of opportunities we look for. All right, so has there been a climate change? Randy talked about the life cycle of um, fundraising, investing, harvesting, and how that's gone through sort of the booms and busts, which is pretty much a cyclical um, event in the history of venture capital. I think every eight to 10 years, um, the cycle repeats itself, and it's driven by combination of the innovation in the marketplace, the opportunity for getting good returns for our limited partners, um, and, the, and sort of the macroeconomic environment. So let's take a look at the current climate as we see it as early stage investors and how it impacts you as entrepreneurs. <clears throat> the macro level, um, I think the two, couple of key takeaways. One is the consumer confidence index keeps going up and down. So what you're seeing here on the slide is a four and a half year window from sort of the middle of uh, 2007 to uh, middle of uh, 2011. And you're looking at sort of four different metrics here. Consumer confidence, US stock market, the public markets, uh, change in GDP, and then the unemployment rate. And I think you would say that the, the first three metrics are basically at the same level now as they were four and a half years ago. So things have essentially been the same, except one metric, which is unemployment rate, which is substantially higher than it's ever been in, the, in recent memory. And you can look at it two ways. You can look at it and say that's a systemic issue that obviously needs to be addressed. Um, 
I look at it as a very positive thing from a, for an entrepreneur because I think that the engine, again, engine of growth, engine of job creation is entrepreneurship. And I think this is the time where society and governments and regulations are all conducive or should be conducive to promoting entrepreneurship. So if you're thinking of starting something, this is actually a great time to do that. Um, and there is actually a lot of money out there. Um, you've seen sort of the inflows into venture capital go down this year, but you know, when I graduated in, in 91 from here, I think we, the, your slide, Randy, showed that $3 billion was raised annually in, in venture capital. And I think this year we'll still raise about $20 billion, uh, if I'm not mistaken. So that's still you know, seven times more money than, than I had coming out in 91, so it's a lot of money. And the good news is that if you're at least in the consumer internet or internet marketplace as an entrepreneur, the cost of developing your product, the cost of distributing it has gone down dramatically. I mean, Moore's Law has come to entrepreneurship, at least in the internet sector, which means that it costs you a lot less money to get your first product, your first customer, um, and even, even to scale your business because a lot of things are now available in the cloud or open source or um, you know, viral marketing techniques that allow your existing customers to spread the news to new customers. So things have only gotten better, I think, for entrepreneurs. A couple of other uptakes. Uh, Randy covered this. I'll skip through it quickly. But so the good news here is that both, both IPOs and M&As, after a long hiatus, have come back. And if you look at 2009, 2010, both of those numbers have been better than their historical uh, averages over the last 10 years. And this year, in particular, 2011, has been, has been a sort of a good news, bad news year in the sense that for, for tech IPOs, there have been many tech IPOs this year. Uh, unfortunately, very few have been able to hold their, hold their value in terms of their uh, you know, stock price based on the offering price on the day they went IPO to the, to the current market price. Uh, that means that if you're a public investor, um, it's not been as great news to buy these IPO sh shares, but uh, for private investors, liquidity events have certainly been there, um, and that's good news, both for GPs and LPs. <clears throat> All right, um, just briefly, we talked about venture funds um, um, raising has gone down. Um, so now let me talk specifically about, that was sort of the macro climate. Now let me talk about how the macro climate impacts uh, all of us, entrepreneurs and investors in the IT sector. And the question that I often get asked or you often read about in the press is, is there a bubble in, in tech, right? And so I look at four things um, to, to answer that question. First, um, it takes a lot less capital to get your proof of concept as we talked about, right? So if you are looking to start a company now, you can, you can set up your servers in the cloud. Amazon offers a very, Amazon, Google, I think eventually Facebook will do the same thing. They offer a cloud-based service to host your computers, your storage, your memory. You don't have to set up your own data center anymore. Um, if you are looking for financing, there are many, many more options. Uh, because it doesn't take a whole lot of money to get your first proof of concept, uh, you can go and raise that money from individual investors as opposed to going to um, institutional investors. So um, those of you who are familiar with Silicon Valley, you may have heard of Ron Conway. Ron was the guy who was you know, essentially the engine of state investments for the last probably 15, 20 years in Silicon Valley. Um, and he was great, and he propelled a lot of companies um, by doing that. Now there are many, many more Ron Conways around, um, which I think is good news for entrepreneurs. Um, but, so the question is, is there a bubble? Uh, and I said that my view is that there is certainly, no, there, is a, there is, seems to be a bubble in innovation and entrepreneurship, which is good, meaning that there are a lot many more people who are coming out of schools and instead sort of deciding to go work for somebody else, they're choosing to start a business. I think that's a good thing, as we talked about earlier, for the economy. Is there a bubble in valuation? I think that story is just unfolding now. And you can, you can only spot a bubble in valuation in hindsight, I think, right? Meaning that as these private companies that have been invested over the last five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years, as they start going out to the public markets, the question remains whether they will hold their valuation. And it's only when you get that data point can you go back and say, well, yes, there was a bubble in the private market. Um, and again, I think the news, the, the, the data there is mixed. You look at the, the previous slide about 2011 IPOs, some companies have gone out and retained or, or increased their valuations uh, compared to their private valuations, and others have not. So it's a mixed bag. Um, I would have a hard time saying that there is a bubble um, in, in IT or at least consumer internet. 
Now, one interesting thing that's happened, uh, which I think is relevant to, to entrepreneurs, is that if you think about the concept of mutual funds, well, what is a mutual fund um, in the public market? Essentially, it's a basket of securities, right? And as investors, you could buy a basket of securities with very little amount of money. You could put in $10,000 into a mutual fund, and you can buy a share in IBM or Google. Uh, you could put even $100 in a mutual fund and buy a share of Google, or a fraction of a share of Google. Um, that concept has come to private markets. There's actually, a, there's a, and I'll just mention one, there's a, there's a fund called 500 Startups. Um, the reason why it's called 500 Startups is that you know, they literally invest in hundreds of startups. Um, it's run by Dave McClure, who's a good friend, and a very smart investor. And that's effectively a mutual fund where you can buy securities in private companies, right? Now, he's not operating as a mutual fund, but essentially that's, that's, that's the analogy. And the reason why he can do that is, again, going back to this thesis that it takes a lot less, more, lot less money to start a company, and with very little money, you can go far and get some data points about product market fit, customer validation, and even business model. So that's a new phenomenon, in, at least in the, in the area that I work in. So what's changed? What's changed for us as investors? And I, I, I use this extreme analogy of the, the Gillette Mach 3 and, and Google. So Gillette Mach 3, anybody know how much money was invested in the Mach 3 before a single user got to use it? Take a guess. How much? A billion. Somebody said a billion. That's exactly right. One billion dollars. One million? Oh, no, one billion. It's a, so the answer is one billion. So Gillette invested one billion dollars with a B before you or I got to use the, the first ever Mach 3. It was like the best, you know, three-layer blade to come along. Well, it didn't take a billion dollars to launch Google or before the first user get to use Google or any of the consumer internet products. And so why is that? Well, if you think about it, how do you launch a consumer product? And what do you need to do to, to be successful at launching a consumer product? Of course, you need to have an idea, some thesis about what is, what is it that the users want? Like, who is your user? What is it they want? How much are they willing to pay for it? How do you validate that thesis, get the product out, distribute it, and make lots, lots many more units if, somebody, if, if at least one person likes it, right? That's how, that's how you used to do consumer, uh, consumer products. <clears throat> And that took a lot of money because you had to deal with R&D, physical distribution, market research, user feedback, safety, all of those things. Right? The cost of failure was very high. If you shipped a blade that cut somebody, it was not a good thing, not a good user experience, right? Well, if you think about how internet products get launched, it's very different. You don't really do market research up front. The way you do market research is you launch the product, and then you get feedback overnight from your users, right? You do A-B testing. So consumer internet companies can launch their first product, do their market validation, do their research post facto as opposed to a priori. This is a very big difference, right? It doesn't, and this is the reason why it doesn't cost a whole lot of money to launch your first version 1.0 product. Think about the distribution channel. The distribution channel for Gillette, very different than the distribution channel for Google or for any other internet company, right? You put up a website, everybody in the world can see it. You don't have to go and negotiate shelf space agreements with retailers. You don't have to put feet on the street. Just a couple of examples of why investors are now expecting entrepreneurs to do a lot more with a lot less because it's actually feasible so when you go out and talk to an investor uh, in your fundraising, typically the investor will ask you, well, how many people are using your product? Now that question would have been unheard of you know, even five years ago if you were a tech, tech entrepreneur. If you're building a semiconductor chipset or if you're building a computer server or a router, well, how many customers are using that product? That, when you're doing a seed or series A investment, that's an irrelevant question because you haven't built a product yet. It takes money to build a product, to buy the components, to do the research, to go and talk to a few prospective customers to see if they will buy the product, right? So all of that took money. Well, nowadays, you can just put it on your website, code it all night. The next day, you can look at your analytics and your logs, and you can see if people like it or not, right? So what do we look for in a nutshell? We look for three things. 
And these three things haven't changed in the last 32 years for our firm. We look for a top 1% team. We look for a very, 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 very large market. And we look for product proof points. And I'll talk about what some of those proof points are. Um, <clears throat> And one important thing to mention here is that we actually look for all three of these things. So it's not one or the other. It's all three of these things. Um, Warren Buffett has an um, adage that I love. Um, I think he said, when great teams meet with lousy markets, it's the reputation of the market that survives. And I think that's, that's very appropriate. If you think about our investment experience, it's not enough it's, it's necessary but not sufficient to have a great team. You also need a very, very large market. Large markets are forgiving. They allow you to make lots of mistakes. You can come back for your second, third, fourth, fifth attempt and still be there. Look at AOL, look at Yahoo. Um, companies have been around for many, many years. Um, some things haven't gone right, but they're still very good companies with lots of users and actually billions of dollars in revenue and profit. So we look for great teams that are in large markets with a product differentiation, something that's about computer science, fundamental insight. What is it about this product that came from your personal experience? Um, earlier in the day, I met with uh, Digifit, and we talked about how the founder had started um, the company based on his personal experience with, um, with a fitness need that he, he had observed. Um, so those are the kind of three things that we look for. And I think those three things haven't changed um, over the years, irrespective of the ups and downs in the market environment. <clears throat> so the kind of things that I'm looking for, sort of personally speaking from my personal investment preferences, um, <clears throat> I think the fundamental, fundamental notion I have is that it's still very early innings. There are 7 billion people on the planet, right? A couple of months ago, there was a UN stat that came out, 7 billion of us on the planet, OK? Facebook has, what, 800 million users? It's pretty large. Still only 10% of the market. So if you want to start a social network and you want to come talk to me, I'm all ears. Come talk to me. It's not too late. 90% of the market is still out there, right? Two-thirds of the world doesn't even have internet access. Just think about that. So it might seem like we're in a bubble, but if you take a macro view, we are just at the very, very, very beginning. So overall, we are very bullish. We are here to invest. Um, we're not retrenching. We have um, a global perspective that says, you know, this thing is just beginning. Now, there are a couple of things that are changing um, with the internet, right? So I, um, Netscape IPO, somebody mentioned 1994, I think, was it? Um, 95, maybe. Um, I was in Silicon Valley. That was sort of the first experience with consumer internet for, for most people like me. Um, and now it's you know, 16 years later. Some things have changed. And so we have a thesis about what's changed. And when, we, when you come to us with an um, idea or a business, in, at least in the internet space, we try, to think, we try to look at that with a lens of you know, what's happening with this internet ecosystem. And I think there are two fundamental changes that I, um, that I believe in and I've seen. One is real names, and the second is mobile. Okay? And the good news is that the internet is getting rewired on both of these dimensions. So every, every company, even if they include big companies, Amazon, eBay, even Google, all of these big companies that did things 10 years ago, Walmart, Target, they're all redoing those things for the social or the, or the internet of real names and the internet of mobile access. And that's a great opportunity because, again, literally the world is getting rewired. So what do I mean by that? So Anyone know this cartoon? This came up in the New Yorker in 93. And it, the cartoon says, you know, on the internet, nobody knows that you're a dog. <laughs> it's really true, right? You, you, didn't, you didn't know because everybody was anonymous, right? You could go visit a website. You could go um, leave a comment. And nobody would know. Well, guess what? That's different now. I just searched for, earlier today, UCSB computer science, right? And that's a Google results page. And you can see there that there is a um, picture of me uh, because I like the result. I love the school. And uh, all of you now, if you do that search, will see my name there as well. So whatever I do now on the web, whether it's clicking on a link, buying something, leaving a comment about a product, my name is associated with that. 
And if you think about that, that's a fundamental change. That forces, if I leave a comment about my car, for example, the manufacturer of the car now has to take me a little bit more seriously, I hope, because they know who I am. In fact, you know who I am. So my friends, my family, my coworkers will know that. So think about how you engage with your customers, this whole notion of customer relationship management, CRM. All of those things are changing. So the real names is a big deal. Um, and if you're not using real names in your business, your advantage, um, you know, think twice. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll move on quickly. Yeah, we've got one, minute. one minute. All right. Um, mobile. We talked about this kid. So think about this. Mobile is bigger than the desktop internet. Will be in the next few years. If you don't, if you don't have a mobile strategy, why not? Everything is going to be accessible to a mobile device. <clears throat> And the last thing I'll say that's different about today's internet than ever, more than ever, is localization. L and N stands for localization. Um, there are 10 letters between L and N. Um, and what that means is that if you, when you offer your product and put it on your website, every user from every, anywhere in the world will access it, and they would prefer it to be in their language, in their currency, in their payment method. So why not offer their product from day one in multiple locales, localize it? And then finally, this is my last slide, and Bill, I'll, uh, forgive me for 30 seconds of discretion here. Um, how, how do you build a company that, that goes IPO? How did we, what did those 74 IPO companies have in common? And I think this is the blueprint in my mind, which has been executed by companies like Amazon and Google, and I think Facebook is on the same path, which is that you start off, it's a three-phase three vision. You start off with a very specific use case. So if you start from the left to the right, in the case of Amazon, it was single-click shopping, checkout, right? You go and find the book, one-click checkout, you're out of there. Google, you search, fast, done. You do something well, really, really well for millions of people, and then you offer that on a mobile device, right? Because we all have our phone in our pocket all the time, so you make the product more usable. And then you decouple your back end from your front end. You invested in building this great platform that's powering your site, but why don't you offer that back end, that service to everybody else who wants to use it as well? And you create a platform ecosystem around you. So if you think about Amazon EC2, Amazon AWS, Google's uh, app engine, Facebook's uh, ecosystem where you can, you know, Zynga, on, Zynga and Facebook, it's a great relationship where you have Zynga apps, games on Facebook platforms. So this concept of starting with a killer app putting it on mobile, and then opening up a platform to let other third-party developers develop on your, your platform, I think is the way that great companies get built starting from day one. And those are the kind of blueprints and templates that we look for uh, and we get excited about. Okay. I'm going to first give a background on, um, on our perspective and how we got involved and, and looking at it. We kind of did it backwards. We did private equity um, after we did the public side, so it gives us a good background of what we want to see the companies um, end up becoming as far as uh, liquidation events or becoming public. Then I'll talk about um, our philosophy and the current economic environment and how that relates to private equity, and then give a couple of examples. And I know we're short on time, so I'm going to go kind of quick so we can take some questions. When uh, Bill told me this would be filmed, I was requested or required to put this up there. So if everyone could read this in detail, really, no, I'm just kidding. So I started West Coast Asset Management here in uh, Santa Barbara 11 years ago. We started managing just public equities uh, for clients and stocks, similar to a Warren Buffett style. Um, one, one thing that makes us unique is that we're very concentrated. We don't spread our investments around too much. We want to be rewarded when we're right for doing the research and the work um, and, and sourcing ideas and spending our hours on the research. Um, we, we also started a West Coast Opportunity Fund and Montecito Venture Partners after about five years of being in business to go after opportunities that were not in the public space. Uh, prior to that, I managed a portfolio with a team at Wilshire Associates in Santa Monica uh, for a billion dollars. And one thing I'm proud of that um, our organization's always been one that's very community focused and that likes to give back. And uh, we've donated a portion of our revenue every year not profits, but our, our revenue every year um, to a charity that our clients choose. So at the end of every year, such as right now, our clients get a letter stating how much money they can give and they tell us where to, where to um, place those funds. And it's been uh, over $300,000 at this point. Uh, the book right there is in, 
is in the back. It, uh, feel free to take a copy. They're, they're free. Bill was worried that someone might think they cost, but take a copy of the book. We've, we've got extras. Uh, it talks about our philosophy. It talks about uh, financials and how you analyze financials and the valuation um, of companies. It was published three years ago by Wiley. So we categorize our style of investing in everything we do, whether it's private or public, as entrepreneurial investing. And um, the key tenet to that really is, is being concentrated, understanding what we know, what we own, knowing exactly what we own. Uh, we prioritize margin of safety, don't want to lose money. Um, and then if you take care of the downside, eventually the upside will take care of itself. Um, we're opportunistic. We're not constrained by any sort of um, style, whether it's public-private, whether it's a certain industry, uh, whether it's a size or category. So. Um, basically, if there's a great deal to be had and, and we understand it and we, we think there's tremendous opportunity, then we'll find a way to finance and fund and invest in that. Uh, we really like to be involved, especially on the private or the smaller companies uh, on the public side, um, whether it means taking board seats, helping with introductions, whatever the case might be. So this really summarizes how we're different, I think. We, we don't really pay too much attention to the noise that, that's going around, say, Wall Street or New York or even in the venture space. We really do our own due diligence and trust our own eyes. Um, this is advice that we got from a fortune cookie, actually. It, it was really on a fortune cookie. And it, it's what we've always done, but it summarizes it well. I think it really helps you avoid pitfalls. When you listen to people and you hear how great things are, um, it's just like when you go to the horse race and the, 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 the jockey and the owner say, yeah, we're going to win this race. Well, everyone says that. Every presentation we see, I've never seen one that had negative cash flow for 10 years, never. So you really need to do your own due diligence and believe you know, what you see, not what others tell you. And I'm going to give you a couple examples of that. So how has advertising changed? And it kind of goes with what we were talking about earlier here. This last time I used this slide in a presentation was three and a half years ago, and it's amazing how many things have changed just since then. At the time, I talked about how um, advertising channels for radio were being just totally disseminated and, and changed because of, of XM and Sirius. That was before anyone knew about Pandora. Now there's Pandora, and I don't know what there's going to be in five years. Um, TiVo, that was, you know, no one really pays attention to commercials so much anymore because of TiVo, and therefore advertising revenue goes down. And, the reason I'm bringing these up is that these are things that we as investors see, and uh, investors are the clients of our money that we see, and it's just, you look at newspapers, for example. The New York Times in the last five years is down 80%. Five years ago, everyone was saying New York Times is an unbelievable newspaper. It's different. It's not the Washington Post. It's not the Tribune. Those will go under, but the New York Times won't. Well, they're not going to get back to where they are. It's a different age. The world's passed them by, just like it's passed by a number of companies. Um, the one that really hasn't changed is billboards. You can't really avoid a billboard. I don't see how you're going to displace a billboard. So don't look at old projections to portray what's going to happen because it usually doesn't happen. Now, Al Gore, he brought us, he invented the internet, and now he's working on the green revolution. So there are so many opportunities with the green space. Has any, how many people here, I'm just going to ask one question, have heard of impact investing and knowing, know what impact investing is? Only five or six. Diana in the back does. So impact investing, they're talking about it being its own asset class. And when Diana mentioned that to me six or eight months ago, I thought she was a little bit crazy. I started doing some research, and sure enough, there's fixed income, there's equity, there's alternatives, and I'm pretty sure in the next two to five years, a separate asset class of impact investing will arise. There's a lot of ways in, that you can analyze this, but the simple way I can explain it is there's plenty of foundations and nonprofits that um, have capital to donate to their causes. Well, the past three or four years, they've lost so much money, they've got smaller amounts of money, and they're, they're kind of in that protection mode of maybe not giving as much as they used to. Um, and, and there's a way they can do it now, and that's impact investing. So rather than keeping their money in, in fixed income instruments that are earning 1% or 2% at best, if they can make an investment that goes along with their cause and just get their capital back, have no return on their investment, but get their capital back, it's an unbelievable opportunity. J.P. Morgan, um, I'd highly encourage you to research impact investing. J.P. Morgan's done a study that said over the next 10 years, there's a potential for 10 or a potential for one trillion dollars to be invested in impact investing. It's here. It's big. 
There's already 50 billion today in impact investing projects. Here's how we define our investments, whether it's doing the analysis before we buy them or how we like to see them mature. Um, margin of safety is, is, again, critical for us. We want to make sure that however we structure an investment or make an investment, that whether it's, there's enough capital to succeed on, on the game plan or the business plan, margin of safety is, is important for us. And there's different ways that you can get that margin of safety. The underlying cash flow of the business is really the life lifeblood of the business, and without that, it, it's just not going to work. We want to analyze, you know, how defensible is that? Is it recurring? Um, what's the sort of left field risk that might, you know, be something that we don't even know about that that'll take out that free cash flow? And then the the quality of management, and frankly, I think this is by far and away the most difficult thing to analyze in any company, whether it's small whether it's big, whether it's a public company, private company, startup, venture, what, any, anything. You know somebody for three or four or five months before you make that investment. You do all the due diligence you want. You talk to people that they want you to talk to most likely. And then at the end of the day, until you actually are in a, in a work environment with that person and doing what they're doing today, it's, it's hard to assess what it is. So one way you can make sure that you, you minimize a risk is that they have their own money and they have their own skin in the game and they're highly incentivized in the same way that you're highly incentivized in. That doesn't take care of all the problems, but it's a good start. Um, another way is, is, is the company to have a winning culture. So you're not betting on, on just one person. There's a whole team there that is incentivized to make the company grow. And then lastly, this is maybe more related to public companies, but also in the private space too, is what's the catalyst? Is there, is there a sale? Is there two or three businesses? And there's a sum of the parts analysis that you know, maybe you can, you can piece out part of the company, um, or is it just a matter of a, a separate investor taking out your investment? So I'm going to skip this one in respect to time, and you can look at it later. So today, where, where are we in the capital markets? Um, Uncertainty is the one thing that capital markets hate. It doesn't matter if it's Wall Street or venture capital or anybody investing money. They don't want uncertainty. They would rather know the worst news possible. If Greece came out tomorrow and defaulted and said, we're done, we're taking a 90% haircut, well, the market would go up. They just don't want uncertainty, and we have a so, much, so much uncertainty. I mean, it, if you look back over time, there's always been uncertainty, but when there's a liquidity crisis, which there still is today, People are really tight with money, and you've got these things out there like the election next year. Um, you've got the downgrading of the U.S. debt. There's just there's a tremendous amount of uncertainty, and with that goes uh, the lack of a desire to put a lot of capital to risk, especially in, in earlier stage companies. Um, I've never I've been in business for 15 years, and I've never seen a time where people demand liquidity, whether it's payments of cash flow or if it's just the, the, the right or obligation to get out of an investment. So I, it's just until we get those solved, it's going to be difficult. So how, how do we migrate as a firm into private equity and venture capital? Um, and uh, Six years ago, when we just did public uh, investments, there was an, an investment that we made in a company that uh, was raising $15 million, and they came to us as, you know, uh, as an investor in the company and wanted us to invest another $5 million. We, we thought it would be better to take the lead, control the investment, structure it how we wanted to structure it, and went to our clients and raised a fund, our first pooled vehicle of money in, in a hedge fund, and raised uh, $35 million and made our first investment. From that, we've done now a number of uh, private investments in public companies and also some venture and, and, and quite a bit of private equity. And then until I saw you, Phil, I forgot, we also were in uh, Stone Canyon, that's a small business investment uh, company that makes investments that you borrow money from the government and uh, get very attractive um, rates of capital. So talking about kind of the structures, both as, as investors, how they invest in things, and then as we determine what we want to invest in and the structure that, that we want to create. Um, again, we, we've got a few different pooled vehicles that focus on different stages of, of, of venture and private equity. Uh, the model that we've gone to just recently in the past 12 to 18 months is instead of having a blind pool of capital of money, finding an investment or an opportunity that we like. Um, and we're, 
the, my principal, my, my partners, the principals of our firm are always the lead investor in everything we do, or the biggest investors in everything we do. So if it's something that we like now, instead of just putting into a blind pool of, of capital or funds, we, we start a single purpose entity to make that one investment. And it's in this environment, it's worked really well because investors now are empowered, they feel empowered. It's, it's, it's not something that we can reinvest the profits of it or we can't sell it and then keep their money. It's one investment. They can determine if it's right for them. And um, we, we, we don't charge fees on it, we just take part of the back end. So I think what's changed a lot in the last five years is there was so much what we in the industry like to call dumb money, where you can just go out and have a great idea, a great story, and a, and a great pitch book and, and, and raise a bunch of money. That's gone, it's done and over for now. So um, if you have clients or investors that can get that institutional control and process and structure in place, but just do it on a per investment basis and not have any sort of fees associated with it until, they're, until they've exited um, profitably, that's what I think's worked really well um, with us this year. So there's more access to capital that way. The investor communication as a startup company or as a private equity company is much easier if there's one, one person, one entity to deal with. Um, it's easier to follow. Now, going to how we like to structure investments in private equity, these are just minimum expectations for us. You know, we, we, again, we always like to lead everything we do. We want to be in control of everything we do. Um, we, we demand liquidation preferences, anti-dilution rights. We want the insiders to be locked up. Um, we want, we want an, a, a, a potential exit, of, depending on what it is. It's not, that one's not quite as critical. We want the companies to be set up and our investment to be set up that we want information from them if it's going well based on projections and what we expect and, and kind of how it's gone then great, we're very you know, hands off. However we can help, we love to help, whether it's introductions or advice we can give them. Um, but we don't want to be, we want them to let them, we want to let them operate and run the business. But if it goes wrong and, and if something is gone array, then we want our clause in there as much as we can. We want to be able to take over. We want to be able to control our, our future of our investment. And that's really, how it's set up. So during the whole process of negotiating and setting the documents up and that sort of thing, it looks like it could be a nasty agreement, but it, at the end of the day, if everybody's making money and projections are met or close to met, then um, there's really not too much to do. What we've started to do too that I think is, is unique is we'll take the projections that we get now because as it says up here that everyone underestimates the, the amount of capital they need and everyone overestimates the future cash flows of the business and how quick they get there. Just, it always happens. And so when we get a proposal and a presentation and we're comfortable that the, and the entrepreneur is sure that they're gonna hit these milestones, our term sheet will reflect those milestones. So we'll say, we're gonna give you the terms you want. If you don't reach your milestones in three, four, five years, whatever it might be, we're gonna take a little bit more equity. And only to be fair, if you do reach those milestones, we'll be the first one that will invest in the company and we'll decide what the terms are today. So just a note of caution on, on doing your projections, I would just make sure that that's something that you really think that you're gonna hit because they can come back to hurt you. The key, the key to everything really is understanding the business. There's, there's things that all of us up here would understand differently when he was talking about some of those apps and psh, over my head, the IP and the tech, the tech stuff. And you know, I'm, we, we specialize in some oil and gas companies. So the, everybody has their own specialty. If, I, if there's an industry that comes along that looks great, but I, can't, I cannot determine or our team can't determine what the competitive advantage is, what's gonna happen in three years, um, what that left field risk is, then it's just something that we, we these, these questions couldn't be answered. What is the recurring revenue gonna be? What's the reinvention risk? What is the competitive advantage? So it's really key for us to understand the business and at that point determine how much of the, the revenue is recurring, um, what sort of reinvention risk is there, who, who's out there developing the product that we don't know about that is gonna displace whatever that we're investing in today. Going back to the, the, the people in the organization and how difficult it is to, to analyze them. You know, a good entrepreneur is not always the, the person that is right to lead the company to the next stage. 
Um, and you, you learn that as you go. So whoever takes it from A to B is not always the right person to take it from, from B to C. And that's why the culture of a company is so critical and something that we really pay attention to. We like to meet the workers. We like to see the headquarters of the company. We like to know what incentive plans that, that they have um, and the operational capabilities that the company has today. The reason this uh, slide is uh, of the oil and gas rig out there is we invested in a company uh, about seven years ago. They challenged their employees, which were 23 at the time, to reach three huge milestones that really were not that easy to reach and not even, they're realistic, but it was a huge stretch. Um, the, if they did succeed though, the value of the company was worth tremendously more. And it was, you know, the challenge was if they reached it, the 23 employees were all flown to Europe to pick out the Volvo of their choice, drive it around for two weeks, and then fly back and they get their Volvo here. So we, we like things like that that really are not so tangible. We like entrepreneurs to understand that it's about the culture of the business, it's not about them, and how can they foster that. And when we, when we find companies that do something special, other than having a, a holiday party at the end of the year, then this really goes a long way in our book, because there's not a lot to do it. Financial capabilities, uh, we got frankly tired of dealing with organizations that spent too much time on it and weren't too good at it. So we've started our own uh, financial services company that pays bills, does HR, does projections, and it allows us two things, to control, and keep going back to control, a little bit of control freaks I know, but we like to control the financials, we like to control the process. And I think it, it's nice that they have somebody that is their investor looking out for them and making sure that everything is run as efficiently as possible. And it gets us the numbers we need faster, it saves them money, and it allows them to focus on what they're good at rather than focusing on something that they're learning as they go. Uh, other stuff is pretty standard. Inside ownership, I mentioned, is, is really critical and key to us. Um, what, I, what I really don't like to see is a presentation that you go through it and it's uh, got the right attributes of what you like, what you want to invest in. It's got everything, the macro things are, you know, it's got the wind at its back and you think, wow, it's a great investment. The pedigree of the management is unbelievable. They've been at Goldman Sachs for 15 years. They've been, you know, somebody else on the board has been a CEO or somebody else on management has been a CEO of a Fortune 50 company. Then you get to the end of the presentation and it says we're looking for $100,000 in seed money to take us to the next level. And I thought, if you were to Goldman Sachs for 15 years, you should be the first one that puts in the $100,000 in your business, not me. And so I just think that you've got to be cautious when you have this unbelievable board of advisors or directors and you think, well, why? this company's based in Texas. There's a lot of money in Texas. How are they finding little old me in Montecito, California, and they've got this huge board and they're looking for $100,000? Something just doesn't add up there. So some, some, some of the thoughts that I have on, on sourcing capital in this environment, we're getting great terms, unbelievable terms, because there's not that much cash out there. So it's a nice time to have cash and to invest in companies because you can set your own terms. One thing that we as investors need to be cautious of, though, is that the interests are aligned in such a way that it's not such uh, a, a, an agreement that has your clause in it so much that the incentives aren't there. So although the terms that we're seeing today are, are, are great, um, it's just, it's uh, something that you need to, to be cautious of when you're taking money that is not too prohibitive where it's not going to set your culture up for the right long-term goals. We work with our council. We don't want them wasting time on that. We're, we're better at it. We're more experienced at it in the structure and the deals. Um, no two deals are alike and every time we do one we learn something else. We do thorough due diligence on, on every contract they have, on every employee they have, background checks on, on all of the people involved with business. So with that, I'm gonna give a couple of examples of uh, two companies that we've invested in. The first one was uh, six years ago. This too was an oil and gas company, a different oil and gas company. It was a $50 million uh, equity value in the company and $23 million in subordinated debt company was raising $15 million. We shared it. We did half with a, a hedge fund that we're um, familiar with. And at the time we made the investment, we thought to ourselves, wow, the best thing that could ever happen is if the company went bankrupt. And that's what happened. And I don't know if it really was the best thing because it wasted uh, two years of our time in a huge way, but it's turned out to be very successful. And we took that through the whole Chapter 11 process, wiped out the $50 million of equity value 
we wiped out the $23 million of debt and gave them 10% equity. So what we have today is the full amount of our debt intact, and we also have 90% um, equity in the company. Uh, we're very involved in this one. We control the board and place people on the board, including ourselves, um, and hired a CEO that's got great experience in this subsector of oil and gas in addition to the location of the company. And this has the potential for us to, by far and away, be our most successful investment. And when we structured this investment, we knew it's different than a, a business that was more of a brand related to, to the management and the people of the company. If this one did go bankrupt, there's assets in the ground. We can get them out. Nothing changes. It's different if it's a company that relies so much on the people and the culture of the business. The second example is one that we did this year. This was the first one that we did. Um, we started doing the due diligence last year, and it's a, the first one that we've done that's a special purpose vehicle for the investment. Um, this company, a software as a service company, came to us looking for you know, $100,000 increment type investment. It's not really something that, that we do at that size, uh, but we liked it so much, we, we dug further and further into it and said, why don't you allow us, thank you, why don't you allow us to do the whole thing? And usually when you're the lead and, and you can take the responsibility of, of the capital raise away from the entrepreneur, you can get better terms. So quite often, that's what we'll do. We'll lead the round and we'll even invest more so we can get a, um, a better deal. This company had all the attributes of a business we like. It was easy to understand. They had a huge defensible marketplace. At the time we made the investment, it was 100% client retention rate. Um, and the, they just needed capital to grow. It wasn't a debt situation. It wasn't anything else. During the due diligence, one of the things that I liked the most was the lack of desire for the CEO to dilute his equity. He's a large shareholder in a company. We kept pushing and we'll give you more money. You know, we'll, we'll structure it in a way that's good for you, but we want more equity. And they kept saying, no, 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 we don't want that. We, we're going to be a big business, and I want to con control as much of the company as I can. So from the first meeting of any investment we have, I think you have to look at it as a test. You know, it, it goes without saying, if you're two minutes late, then that's not going to bode well. But if, if there's documents that are requested and they say they're going to deliver them on Thursday at 5, it sounds silly, but you get emails at 4.50 saying, hey, I'm still working on this, I'll get it to you at 5.30. It's not what you want to see. It's disaster. If you tell somebody you're going to get them something at 5 o'clock on Thursday, get it to them on Wednesday at 5 and press them. And that company did this. Everything they said they would do, they did. They did it early. Um, they said the right things. And we made the investment. We did do it in a preferred nature. Um, had anti-dilution rights again so we can protect our investment if, if more capital is raised. And as I mentioned before, we set it up in a way that if the milestones that they said were realistic that they were going to reach were met, they were going to need more capital to take it to the next level again. I said, okay, well, we'll take that out of your hands, and if you reach those milestones, we will make that investment so you don't have to worry about that. But if you don't, then we, we want to ratchet and own more of the company because it's not going to be worth as much to us. So that's what we agreed to. It's worked really well. Um, it's been a year now, and, and they are ahead of schedule, and we're going to be making our second investment prior to when we originally in, uh, thought we would. How much this is a chapter from our book. It's 10 Signs of a Strong Company, and it's kind of a first impression that you, can, you should look at in, in your presentation to make sure that you don't have to have all these attributes, but make sure the ones you're strong at you really focus on and, and, and make that the key of your presentations. So again, just to summarize, we like businesses that have a, a huge margin of safety, um, and then we like to control the process and be a true partner with whatever investment that we decide to make rather than kind of a passive investor. My biography doesn't tell you very much about why I'm an angel investor. Uh, the most important reason why I'm an angel investor is because I'm the grandchild of immigrants. My grandparents came here in 1930. That's right, they came at the height of the Depression uh, because they heard there was opportunity in this country. And they would tell me stories about the old country all the time. And I'd ask my mom, if the old country was so great, what are they doing here? And she told me two things. First of all, they came here because they were in control of their own destiny in a way that they couldn't be. In, in Europe. Uh, and the second reason was they came here for you. 
They came here so I could have a better life, so I could benefit from the opportunity that this country affords everybody. And uh, I, I took that to heart, and, and my mom also laid a guilt trip on me. If you're ever in a position to help other people realize, realize the, the dream of, of this country, you should do something about it. That's why I'm an angel investor. So the, the, the topic is some of the rules have changed. Uh, I'm, I'm going to dance around that a little bit, uh, but, but, I'll, but I'll get to it along the way. So first of all, we need to recognize that angel investing is not new. So anybody know what this is? Christopher Columbus. This is Christopher Columbus giving his elevator pitch to Queen Isabella. Uh, I don't know what the term sheet looked like, but um, he closed the deal and uh, he started his business. I think he had five or six follow-on rounds too, and he did okay. Actually, I'm just messing with you. This was last week's TCA screening meeting. So th that's me in the, the, the blue outfit over there. I'm the only ones that can rock the, uh, the white tights. But um, angel investing has been around for a long time. Uh, and it has very much to do with someone who has an idea and someone who has some money to invest in that idea and understands what that person is trying to get at with the, with, with the business. So real quickly, what is an angel investor? According to the SEC, an angel investor is, is uh, anyone who makes a private investment in a company. But, but the angel investors we're going to zero in on are the accredited investors. And those are the people who have either a million dollars in investable assets or they've had $200,000 in income, 300 joint for the last two years. And, um, your first question is, well, how many of those people could there possibly be? And the answer is a lot more than you might think. There are 10 million of them in the country today with all the financial difficulties we're having. Uh, and there are expected to be 20 million in the next couple of years. So there's a pretty big pool to draw from. And, and I think that that statistic uh, is, is going to be an important indicator of what I'd like to see happen to angel investing. Angel investors are often entrepreneurs themselves. Uh, most angel investors are not investing just for the money. They're also investing because they've been through it before, they want to help, and they want to see you succeed. If you look at the, uh, now we'll, we'll talk about the change part of, uh, of angel investing and how it's changed in the past five or six years. Uh, it used to be that if you wanted to start a tech company, and I did this 10 years ago. You had to buy servers. You had to buy more servers than you possibly needed so that you could, uh, you could manage your peaks. Uh, and that was all expensive. I, I remember combing dead dot-com auctions. My first startup was right after the dot-com bubble burst, and we bought a lot of our servers at auction. Uh, but um, you needed a million dollars to get started, even if you were a software business. Uh, now. You provision your servers from Amazon EC2. Uh, there's plenty of open source software to get you started. Uh, and uh, broadband is relatively inexpensive. Uh, it doesn't just apply to software either. I want to make that clear as well. I'm working with a startup in Camarillo. We needed a little part manufactured. We found an engineer uh, in Sherman Oaks to design it. Uh, it took, that took him a few days. Uh, he had a prototype 3D printed. Uh, in a few days, and we found a company in Valencia that makes uh, foot inserts. They have inje in, uh, a bunch of injection molding lines, and they made the part for us in a few weeks. We didn't have to go to China. It wasn't ridiculously expensive. It was all done here. Uh, but the technology has enabled us to do that. So the effect on angel investing, uh, this, this uh, need to have less capital to start up, change the rules of the, of the game for angels. A angels used to be in wealthy individuals, and uh, that's not necessary anymore. If you need $250,000 to start a business, uh, you, can, you, you, can, you can accumulate that kind of capital from a group. Uh, and when the, the, the bar was lowered, it, 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 uh, it brought a lot more angels into, into, uh, into the mix, and those angels needed to, to uh, to compare notes with each other as well. And that gave rise to angel groups. 
Speaking of angel groups, TCA is not one of the largest. We are the largest angel investing group in the country. We were eclipsed by a group in Ohio for a few months, and I, I still don't get that one. I, I, I could, I'd be okay with like San Jose, but Ohio? Uh, but um, but we've, since, uh, we've since passed them again. We have about 300 accredited investors. We have five networks. I'm the president of the Central Coast Network, which runs from Westlake Village to Santa Barbara, and then we pretty much cover the rest of Southern California. There's also angel investing groups that we, that we collaborate with in Pasadena, and there's Maverick Angels in Westlake Village as well. Uh, we, um, we do about 10 to 15 deals a year. We see somewhere between 600 and 800 applications a year, which means we fund about one and a half, two percent. Uh, if you find that, that number a little too daunting, don't, don't worry just yet. Uh, while, there may just, while, while it may be true that there's no such thing as a stupid question, that doesn't necessarily apply to funding applications. We get a lot of funding applications that we just that we dismiss out of hand. This is our investing process. And I want you to keep four Fs in mind. Find, filter, fund, follow. Uh, the part of the process that the entrepreneur most often overlooks or glosses over is the process of getting to know angels before they submit the application. Before you apply for, for, for funding, you should have met some of the angels in the group. You should go check them out on LinkedIn or go check them out on AngelList. Find out who you need to target, and I'll explain why that's important in, in, in a little bit. Uh, the filtering process is where, is where we, 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 we get funding applications, we take a look at them, we have uh, folks from our network who are specialists in a particular area, look at them, vet the technology, look at the financials, decide if, if, uh, if it, it's a good fit for our business and decide which ones need to be screened. Screening process is where uh, you come visit us, uh, you give us a 15 minute pitch, uh, we ask you a lot of questions, uh, some of which are uncomfortable, most of which are not. It's typically not that bad a process. Uh, and through that screening process, we decide which investments we're going to make. Now, uh, something else you should also understand about angel investing groups uh, is we invest individually. We, there's not a fund. Uh, we each decide individually that we're going to invest. Why would you pursue angel capital as opposed to other kinds of capital? Uh, on the good side, we give you more fundraising options. Uh, we're, we're, we're very much open to, to all kinds of, uh, all, all kinds of, um, uh, of, of ways to raise funds and all kinds of, of, uh, of company types. Um, we have a common term sheet, so even though you're dealing with individual investors, we've all agreed that we're going to accept whatever term sheet is negotiated by the, by the deal lead. I'll talk about the deal lead in a minute. Uh, the decision-making priorities tend to be different with angels. Uh, it's, it's much more common for angels to, to, to invest with their hearts first. It doesn't mean that they're going to overlook the financials, but, but the criteria will sometimes be different. Uh, and they tend to bring more than money to the deal. Uh, they very much open their, their Rolodexes, and they're there to help with the business and to give you advice. Now, on the bad side, uh, the process does take time. It, it, uh, you, you can count on at least six months, maybe as many as nine, if you're looking for angel investing to get all the way through the process. So you need to start thinking about it before you think you need the money. Uh, it does require more patience. Uh, we have 300 members. Most of them were successful heads of companies and are used to being in charge. So they have their own opinions and uh, are not afraid to voice them, and getting a consensus is, is very difficult. Uh, angels tend to be more sensitive to valuation as well, uh, and um, you need to be, to be uh, sensitive to that. Some tips for success. Uh, I'm not going to go through this in detail, but in a 15-minute pitch, we look for you to communicate all of this to us, all of it. Uh, and we've seen enough of them to know that it's possible. So you need to give a... a uh, uh, you, you need to get this all in in 15 minutes. 
We typically give you 15 minutes after the pitch to ask questions and answers, and this really is the heart. Uh, most of, our, most of our, uh, our, our investors will make up their minds based on those 15 minutes. There's due diligence that, f that follows, there's follow-up questions, but that's, that's what does the trick right there. Uh, when you give a pitch, you need to make sure it's, it's uh, rehearsed, memorized, and internalized. Um, it, it really needs to get to the point where if, if we're talking and I say, what's your pitch, you, you need to be able to tell me without hesitation. It typically makes sense to have one presenter. Two presenters tend to waste time uh, and put a lot of thought into your evaluation. I said it again. Um, I'll continue to say it. And, and also, do some research. Don't uh, ask just your attorney or just your Uncle Joe or just someone who's in the industry. Get a lot of opinions about what your valuation should be. Very important, uh, very important part of pitching to angel investors. You're looking for one person in the room, uh, and that's the person who gets your business and wants to invest alongside you. We call that person the deal lead, but you're looking for that one person, uh, which makes it all the more important that you get to know the people who are gonna be in the room before the presentation. It's always about friends and family. One of our portfolio companies, the CEO, told me this because he's at the point where he's now, he's now talking to VCs. Uh, you need to remember that we talk to each other and uh, that we very much value each other's opinions. So uh, seeking capital is very much a social networking exercise. Uh, your friends and family invest in you because they know you and they trust you. Uh, we don't know you, we, we will get to know you, and we will come to trust you, especially after the first exit, uh, in which case we may love you as well, depending upon how good the exit is. Um, what matters most? The same things that matter in any social network. Have you done it before? Have, how trustworthy are you? What's your background? Uh, who do you know? What do you know? And how passionate are you about your business? Uh, I'll, um, if anyone wants this list, I'm not going to go through this as well, but make sure you get involved. Uh, there are plenty of groups uh, between Santa Barbara and Westlake Village that cater to entrepreneurs, that give you social networking opportunities. Uh, you'll very often see TCA members show up at these, at these events and you get a chance to talk to them. Um, 805 Startups is having a, a holiday party the first, uh, the first weekend in December, or the first week in December. Uh, TCA sponsors events all the time. And uh, then I wanted to mention the one at the end, which I'm very enthusiastic about, uh, the new venture competition. Anybody in the room planning to enter the new venture competition? Excellent, excellent. This, this program is, is a cornerstone of the entrepreneurial community. I can't emphasize that enough. Two of the last three winners uh, have attracted angel capital. So they graduated and they went into the business, into business, and the third of the three is about to start the process. So if you're not a UCSB student and planning on participate, seriously consider being a mentor. It's amazing what, what these guys come up with. So what I like to talk about in presentations like this is not so much what, what is, but, but what's next, because I think there's a lot of potential change on the horizon that's worth tar talking about. In TCA's world, there are some things that we're doing differently that, uh, that address some of the issues we've had in the past and also make it a little easier to be an angel investor. We've very deliberately started syndicating with other angel groups. Our, our criteria tend to be the same, and uh, the types of investments we make are the same. The raises are, are increasing in a lot of cases, and we can't necessarily raise a million, million and a half dollars on our own, so we're turning to our peer groups uh, looking for syndication. You'll see a lot more of that. Uh, the Angel Capital for Entrepreneurs Fund is, is a TCA uh, innovation, we, 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 start, we raised a fund that invests in companies that TCA members invest in. So for TCA members, it's a great way to diversify very quickly uh, uh, into startups that your peers have seen something in. We raised over $3 million. We actually just closed the fund, but we expect to start another one. And you don't need to be a TCA member uh, to, to buy into the fund. You do need to be accredited, though. Uh, and we also started something called SeedTrack to address the speed issue. Um, 
we now have a pilot program where if you've got a good idea, but it doesn't quite measure up to all the standards we have to raise half a million, a million dollars, uh, we will, um, We'll, we'll allow you to give a 10-minute pitch. You have to be referred by a TCA member who's investing. And you give your pitch, and we'll commit up to $100,000 on the spot. We'll do a little bit of due diligence afterwards, but uh, that's what we're doing to improve the, 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 the speed. The, uh, there are a few points I want to make about the changing landscape, not just about angel investing, but about the business, and a lot of this is personal. Number one is, uh, and, and I've been an angel investor for about three years now. I haven't been doing it very long. Uh, one of my passions is, is sustainable business. Uh, the process is very much built to look for exits. We want to see you build a company, grow it for five years, and then sell it. Uh, and while I think there's value to that, I also think there's value to finding companies that, that want to be in business forever and that don't necessarily need to be sold and that my investment is not looking for an exit, it's looking to be handed down to my kids. That needs, th it would be nice to see that. Um, I think it's, it's, it's a, I have a 12-year-old and a 14-year-old, and I look at the job market, and I'm already worrying about them. Uh, I think that entre on, the best, some of the best entrepreneurs I've ever been met are, are too young to know that what they're doing isn't possible, and they do it anyway. And, and I want to see more of that. Incubators and accelerators, they're popping up all over the place. I'm not sure we figured out what their best value is, but I think there's a place for, especially with younger entrepreneurs, is giving them a chance to, to spread their wings a little bit before they have to start worrying about valuations and the financial details of the business. I'm also passionate about rediscovering the manufacturing sector. Um, if you read just the press, I think most people in this country seem to think that we don't make stuff anymore, and that's not true. Uh, not only that, we still have some of the best manufacturing resources in the world, and I don't expect that to change. But if we don't do something about it now, we will lose it. And then mass applied research. Anyone been to a hacker space? Uh, to me, this is the most, important, the most important thing I see coming down the road that, uh, that, 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 that has, uh, that, has uh, uh, that, uh, that gives me hope for the manufacturing sector. These hacker spaces are meant for engineers to congregate, to make stuff, and to experiment, and to compare notes, and to just have fun. Uh, and uh, it's, it's meant as a hobby. It's not really meant uh, as, as, as a, a money-making venture, but the fact that we've got, we've got these folks who are congregating to just talk about how they can make better products, better technology to me is important and I think needs to be nurtured. On the investing side, uh, who's heard of AngelList? Okay, so it took, it took TCA 12 years to get 300 members. AngelList has 1,800 accredited investors in 18 months. Uh, I think that needs to be paid attention to. Uh, from our perspective, we don't see it as a threat uh, because it is, it's still very much about social networking. They're doing a lot of deals, but we still see the need for, lo for local groups. If you haven't seen AngelList before, go check it out. It is really well designed. And from an angel investor's perspective, it's a lot of fun to use. Uh, and from an, I use it from an entrepreneur's perspective too. It's a great way to 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 find and um, and negotiate with uh, with entrepreneur or with angel investors. Uh, there was a question about crowdfunding. Um, my short answer is I'm not sure whether it's a good thing. I'd like to think that it is, but what's most important to me about crowdfunding is that before someone takes advantage of it, we find a way to govern it ourselves, uh, because we don't want the federal government governing it. I don't think it'll work if that's what it comes to. And we need more angels. If we're gonna have 20 million millionaires uh, by uh, whenever it was, uh, the last time the Angel Capital Association counted members of angel groups, there were 7,000 of them. So there are plenty more potential angel, angel members out there. Uh, and then the, the uh, I wanted to end with the federal government. Um, 
This is something we tend to overlook, uh, but I think that it's important that we have an appreciation for uh, how, the, how the federal government sometimes hinders small business and also how it can help. So on the left-hand side is what I'd like to refer to as the axis of evil of legislation for small businesses. Every single one of them has to do with some sort of misdeed committed by big companies that small businesses pay for. And no individual can change this, but uh, it's up to all of us to kind of keep an eye on it. Um, starting with Sarbanes-Oxley, that's pretty much led to the demise of the small company IPO. Uh, the, the patent reform's more, more recent. I'm not an expert on patent reform, but what I heard, from what I heard about it, what probably concerns me the most is that we, we reformed our system to be just like the rest of the world. And we're known for our our patent system, and if we're, the business person in me says that if we're known for our patent system, it needs to be different. Now, how can the feds add value? Um, I, I, had, I had a lot of the Department of Energy National Laboratories as clients at one point in my career. If you've never been to a DOE National Laboratory and seen the research, the federally funded research that goes on there, that's very high risk, that no investor is gonna wanna touch, you'll feel a lot better about where your taxpayer dollars are going. Uh, funding cutting-edge research is absolutely important. Subsidizing infrastructure. Um, the, Solyndra, the Solyndra affair, I, I think, gets too much press, and I don't think that people realize uh, how much federal investment goes into uh, infrastructure, for example. For clean tech, one of the biggest barriers to clean tech adoption is the lack of transmission and distribution lines so that you can get the power to the people who, who need it. There's, I work with a wind turbine company. There's lots of wind in Texas, uh, but there's no place to get it to where the lights are. So that kind of investment makes sense to me from a federal perspective. And then I just came across this one, and I want to make sure everybody's aware of it. Uh, H.R. 2930, the Entrepreneur Access to Capital Act, Act, also known as the Crowdfunding Act. In a nutshell, if this passes, anybody with a business is allowed to raise a million dollars a year, two million if you provide audited financial statements, every year from anybody, not an accredited investor, anybody. And the limitation is, uh, the most you can raise is $10,000 or 10% of that person's annual salary, whichever is lower. I'm fascinated by the bill. I don't know where it's going to take us, but I, I, I think we all need to pay attention to it because it's a, it's a completely different way of looking at, at, uh, at the way you raise, you raise capital. I, I, f I found out about it. I went to govtrack.us to track it. It was in, it was in uh, committee. Um, I got an alert a few days later that already passed the House by a lot. And, and just so you know, every representative in the state of California voted yes. So there, there, there's support uh, in the state for it as well. But keep an eye on it. I was really interested by your comment on your optimism for a return of manufacturing to the United States. How much do you think automation will play in uh, a manufa greater manufacturing role? I, I think and if I can expand that also to the other panelists if you have experience in that. I, I, th I think automation plays a very important part in it. If, if you remove cheap labor from the equation, then it, give, it gives us a more, a, a more even playing field. Uh, but I, I, I think that the other part of it uh, is that uh, skilled labor becomes more important. Um, we, we have a shortage. If you want to start a manufacturing business, your, your key hire is the machinist, uh, the blue collar, the skilled blue collar jobs that, that, that have disappeared. And, and I think it's just as important that we make sure that we have that, those kinds of skills. I'm, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying we need to manufacture everything. We need to manufacture the complicated stuff. Um, if you go to um, Scottsdale, Arizona, outside of Scottsdale, Arizona, uh, you drive by, you drive south, you drive by all these big white buildings. From a distance, you wonder what they are. You get closer, you see the big Intel sign. That's one of Intel's wafer fabs. 
and they make their 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 most complicated uh, their most complicated uh, chips there, not in China, not in Japan, Scottsdale, Arizona. I don't have as much experience as Mike does on, in that area, but I'll tell you a fun manufacturing story that we just invested in. So there's a company, you can, you can actually now get custom jeans made. So this company is doing to jeans what Dell did to PCs. So you can like, you know, individual person can order a customized jeans and they make one jean at a time. So it's not an assembly line of denim. Uh, and the, the manufacturing facility is right here in LA. Uh, it's a company called IndieJeans.com. Check it out. Order one for yourself. <laughs> the problem I have is that we, um, we're not going to make a profit for a while, but we're going to spend a lot of money on, on development work. If we had an investor that was able to accrue that, I think it would be a benefit to us, the investor, and, and you know, the government. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a huge issue for uh, clean tech. Uh, because the only way that clean tech can can uh, can uh, can show a cost or a cost advantage versus fossil fuels is is with is with is with subsidies. Now, what people don't realize is that fossil fuels are probably more subsidized than clean tech is. But there's a lot of talk about eliminating clean tech subsidies, and I don't hear any talk about eliminating s subsidies for fossil fuels. Uh, but uh, I think that research R&D credits, SBIR grants, uh, when we see SBIR grants in a pitch, uh, we like that. It's, it's contributed capital without, w w without, a, without an equity position. Well, that, that, that's, uh, that's ideal. There's been a lot of talk recently about Santa Barbara being called Techtopia one of the ultimate places in the country to start and grow a high-tech business. You guys all have roots here to some degree. What do you see as a real opportunity for this part of the South Coast, and uh, how do you think we can most capitalize on that? Well, I'll, I'll go first. I mean, I think, obviously, the, the biggest asset is the university and the pool of entrepreneurs that are already here. Um, I mean, if you look at what's happened in Silicon Valley, the ingredient, the key ingredients are talent, um, that comes from academia with a mindset of starting something as opposed to joining an existing establishment. And I think that mindset comes from the people around you. And I think the more entrepreneurs we have in the area, the more it fuels us. It's a virtuous circle. Um, so I think we have a good start. I think events like this um, serve a great purpose in facilitating that spirit of entrepreneurship. Um, and I think the money certainly is here. I mean, you talked about, you, know, you see all um, levels of investments um, capabilities on the table here. Um, I'm actually very excited about Santa Barbara, and I would love to see our firm on that list of slide that um, you had earlier, where um, you know a bunch of VCs from Silicon Valley are already investing here. So I think I'm actually very excited about it. And just look at the turnout here; it's fantastic. Yeah, I don't. I don't think it'll ever be like like Silicon Valley, but it's a it's a great place to live, and it attracts people that have a whole lot of money and experience and um, I think it can kind of be like a mini, mini Silicon Valley, and the more events such as this that you have, and the more groups that are out here, um, there's a lot of little boutique investment companies out here that people don't realize. And I've been I've been here for 10 years in the business, and it, it ceases to amaze me when someone says, "Oh, have you heard about XYZ Capital? They manage 500 million dollars." And you're like, no, I never heard of it. So, I think just people in Santa Barbara are really private and they don't really, you know, there's a lot of hidden groups and hidden assets and hidden money out there, but it's just a matter of trying to open up the, the sources and networks. If you're seeing a trend between, a merge between life sciences and IT, management of information, especially after the, you know, uh, genome revolution of so many companies pouring a lot of resources into generating a lot of biological data. I, we, we do invest in a lot of hardware and software tech type companies, software especially. Uh, believe it or not, we do, we do a lot of consumer products investments. Uh, and um, I, I think there are a couple of reasons for that. Probably most important is uh, if, if, in, if, if angel investors are investing with their hearts, it's, it, it's easier to connect with something that you might actually use. But uh, we, we do a fair amount of... Uh, fair amount of consumer goods investing as well. And, and uh, clean tech's tougher. Clean tech's tougher for angels because it, it usually is more capital intensive. And uh, it's a little bit more of an uphill climb. It's not impossible, though. Do you do biotech? 
Yes, we do. We do, we do biotech. Uh, our San Diego network has, has a, a biotech uh, expertise. We just did a, uh, we just, we've done a couple of million dollar rounds with biotech. Maverick Angels does a lot of biotech too. There are a lot of ex Amgen guys. We talked a lot about how inexpensive it is to start a company in 2011 given cloud services, but we didn't really talk about the cost of IP and filing patents, especially where Silicon Valley is, talks about social mobile. You're going against giants, and I'm, I have a lot of experience in this now. You know, how valuable, and you know, when you talk about your fundraising, is, your, is the patent portfolio and, um, and taking that expense. So what, what, what you know, do you look at when you're, when you're looking at deals? So, I mean, no longer do we need a $10,000 server system and, and full, of, full of racks anymore, but all of a sudden it's, you know, it's a, for per patent, it could be up to $100,000, and you don't even know if you had it. How valuable is that in, uh, when you're referencing and you're doing your due diligence? Yeah, no, I think absolutely valuable. It, it is a, and you're right, that you cannot, you know, file for patent with $10,000 to fund the business. So, typically when we encounter a situation like that, we, we make a separate provision for the patent expenses and, you know, help, usually help um, put the company in touch with patent attorneys who have experience in that area. Um, I think in the mobile space in particular, patents have clearly become um, um, a tool in the big uh, wars that are going on between larger companies. I think that in, in our life sciences practice, patents certainly have a much bigger role because a lot of the innovation there is um, um, patentable and uh, those are not business method patents, those are really sort of technical innovation IP patents. Um, so, but the short answer to your question is absolutely we consider that and we make a separate allocation of funds for patent filing.